for those dealing with grief, an outlet to discuss their pain and to discuss the things that they're going through is exceptionally important. Tom Morris is the founder of such a group. Grieving Teens has been around since 1997, and today I'll be interviewing him and we'll discuss the origins and how he has ran the group since then. Hi, Tom. Thank you for joining me. It's good to see you again, Harrison. So the biggest question I think everyone wants to know is how Grieving Teens actually got its start back in 1997. Could you elaborate on how you actually founded it? It was kind of an accident. One oh. of my uh, friends, who is a health class teacher, lost both of his parents in the same year. And uh, as the, the fall was coming around, he was unable to talk about death and dying. In previous years, I had talked to his class about much more interesting things like sex and marriage and relationships and self-identity and those kinds of things. But he asked me, would you come in and talk about death? So I said, yes. And uh, the school year was uh, beginning right after um, the death of Lady Diana. And uh, the night before it was her funeral. So I recorded on a thing that used to be called VHS, uh, the, the program. We played part of it as, as the kids came into the classroom and uh, we brought in a casket from one of the local funeral homes and it was open up in front. And this was 23 years ago. People didn't talk about death like we do now. A lot of the movies mentioned death and dying, but back in the day, people died and they got shot but nobody ever talked about how it affected people. And it wasn't a conversation that people had around the table. It was the unspoken thing that was never mentioned. So um, as we began talking about death and dying in this health class, kids who had not dealt with issues of death in their own lives, whether it had been a grandmother who had died, a friend who had been shot, um, a mother who had died of cancer, a father who had a heart attack, those kinds of things that never talked about it. And then as we started talking about how death affects people in this health class, people started breaking down and crying. Um, several people had to leave the room, not because we were doing anything gross. It was just they couldn't handle talking about death. And after six periods of that, I realized I needed to do something to help these kids that we identified in talking about it, um, how to help them. And it was something that you, there was only one book that I was able to find at the time that talked about teenagers and grief. And it was called the grieving teen. And uh, so that's where I started. Then a few years later, after running groups and getting kids to talk about what they were feeling and dealing with, I went back to school to learn all I could about it. And uh, that's how grieving teens began. There were no materials, so it all had to be kind of done by uh, trial and error what helped people, what didn't help people. And that's how it began. So starting out, what would you say the biggest challenges you faced? Understanding how to help somebody, um, understanding how grief affect people, uh, young people, especially, it, you know, it, um, I had had one previous experience back in 1992. I went to the uh, Betty Ford uh, Professionals and Residence Program where I was uh, involved in a grief group for the first time in my life uh, with some people from television and the entertainment world sitting in a circle talking about their grief and how it drove and motivated their 
drug uh, or alcohol addictions. So that was my only reference um, of, of what it might look like. I majored in small group communication in college, so that helped. But um, the other thing was convincing people that it would really help someone to talk about it. It was not 20 years ago, it was not generally considered something, a grief support group. They didn't have them in schools. They didn't, they had maybe an AA group or a, an NA group every once in a while, but they had nothing like that. And then uh, when, when there was an, an, an outbreak of uh, interest in cutting with girls because of different TV programs, there was uh, a lot of self-injury going on and, and uh, convincing people that it was worthwhile. After, after a while, when teachers and administrators saw that kids were dealing better with their anger or their uh, self-loathing or whatever that they were dealing with, that is what began to, that was the biggest obstacle perception. Were there any unexpected surprises that you couldn't account for starting out or anything that popped up later on that you didn't really know how to handle? Yeah, every day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's the thing about running groups with kids. You never hear the same story twice, really, and how it affects them. And most Young people, they don't just have one situation. They may have one situation that brought them to the group initially. Dad died, mom died. But then you find out that there has been a succession of other losses and uh, other issues in the family and in their lives that have affected them in a lot of ways. People either explode or implode when they are dealing with intense emotions. People either know right away that there's something really going on or, uh, or they hide it and then they, they suffer silently. Which would you say is the more common one that you find in teenagers and young adults? Would you say they're more internal and they internalize it or would you say that it's more external? Well, I would say probably in most cases, it's kind of a combination of both. I used to substitute, and uh, every time I substituted, I could, I could begin to identify kids in the classes, whether it was uh, computer or German or uh, dance or I, I substituted for all kinds of crazy things or PE, but PE actually gave me the, the, the clearest insight to how people interact with each other because there's more uh, freedom and there's more interrelatedness and you can see who's angry, you can see who's depressed, who's uh, withdrawn, who doesn't have any friends, who, who has a whole bunch of friends but just on the surface. You see a lot of dynamics that you wouldn't see um, if you just met them in the office. So you'd say that being a substitute gave you a lot of insight and ability to view a sort of window into other people's personal lives. Yeah, you, you can see what's going on if you're observing. Um, you know, I worked with kids on probation for many years and worked with normal kids. And after a while, you, you can pick up things or they're, they're markers about how they feel about themselves and how they feel about others. And uh, teachers are another good source of um, information about who might be going through something. When someone's grades, this is, this is really why the school cares about grief is because kids' grades drop. It takes an academic dive. It can take an academic dive or it can take a athletic dive. Hmm. We've had baseball players that their grandfather 
and all of a sudden they couldn't focus on the ball. They had no energy to, to uh, do what they were used to be able to do. And the coach wants to know what in the heck has happened to my star player. Which and actually he, leads me to my next question is how do students typically get involved within your groups? Do they get recommended by parents, teachers, coworkers, friends? All of the above. Uh, each of the schools, they had their own history. Uh, but uh, Palm Desert started off with um, basically I, I, I made presentations each semester at the health classes and kids who talked about gr their grief issues and the groups in, in, in the classroom situation. We, we you know we'd, we'd ask questions. Have you had how many of you had somebody died in your family in the last two years, five years, that kind of thing? And how has it affected you? And I'd be talking about the effects of grief. So that was our main initial identifying mechanism to find kids by, through the freshmen that were having issues. And then we would have things like car accidents murders, just weird accidents. We had a high school kid walking home from football at Palm Desert High School and just collapsed and died. And uh, that affected, you know, like 60 other kids. So we had to start six or seven different grief groups all at once to, to help them with what had happened and uh, some of them didn't need much help. And a lot of them were involved in the groups for the next three or four years. What's the most common way that students get recommended to you? Uh, it really varies, but uh, when possible, the best source is other students. The other students in the group, because of their experience in the group and with their experience with, with loss, they, they, can, they, they learn how to spot it in their friends as well. Uh, counselors spot it. Uh, I've worked with the, the assistant principal of discipline. We, uh, we know, you know, behavioral, violent, behavioral issues is another indicator that something is definitely going on. And, uh, and if the administrator can care enough about the student individually to, to listen and find out, they, those were some of the, the better referrals. Uh, I've had kids that were escorted through to the group with security guards, and I have other kids that are just begging to come to the group. But usually when they, even the ones that don't want to be a part of it, when they realize that they're not alone is the main thing that they get out of it. That I, you know, I've been dealing with this all these years, thinking I was the only one and find out that there are other kids with similar struggles. It, it gives them a sense of uh, finding a place to belong. So for those students who don't get recommended to you for one reason or another, or they just fly under the radar, but you see them and you catch them at schools when you're visiting from time to time, how do you approach them? How do you typically go up to them and explain who you are, what you do, how to help them? What would you say? Uh, first of all, I would find out who they are and I would talk to their counselor and see if there is anything that they know of that, might lead to what I saw. And, uh, and a lot of times, yes, they, you know, so, something happened years ago and they, they didn't think it really would have any impact on the present, but sometimes a death five, 10 years ago, even in a high school kid's life can be traumatic um, if it's never been talked about or dealt with so unaddressed and untalked about so, issues uh, I, unresolved. I, would, I would you know ask if i could talk to the person 
and they would call the person into the office and, uh, I would, and I'd tell them about the, the grief group. And uh, that's how I would, would sometimes approach it. Um, or I would ask the counselor, how are their grades? Have they suddenly dropped? That would be another approach. And, or, uh, or I asked the, uh, the counselor, yeah, they just got busted uh, with two other people for a fight yesterday uh, after school. Then you, then you know, yep, yeah, there is something going on here. It's not just what I saw. And I, then you, you, I tell them, if I, they let me talk to them, I would, and a lot of times the counselors are very open to letting you talk to them because they know something's wrong, but they don't know how to deal with it. And they don't have the time to deal with it because they have 600 kids or more on their caseload. And they're just trying, their main goal is to get them through high school. Yes. So beyond this point though, what do you typically say to the kids? How do you typically bring them into the groups? when you actually meet up with them after you get either the recommendation from the counselors or the teachers have spoken to you? Well, if they come to the group as it, with, at the invitation of a friend or the recommendation of their counselor or a teacher, they just come to the group and they sit there and they listen to the other people talk about why they're there. And usually by the end of hearing seven or eight other people share their death or divorce or daddy issues or wh whatever, uh, they get an idea that, yeah, that these people might understand what I'm dealing with. Hmm. So just to show them that they're not alone and there are other people dealing with these types of things is enough sometimes. Some people, all they need to know is what the grief process is and to know that what they're feeling and experiencing doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. Mm. And they, they can figure it out on their own. Others need the support of other people because there have been a whole bunch of other things going on in their life. And, and then there's another group of people that don't really have a family where they can talk about their lives with their parent, parents, siblings, um, or even their friends. A lot of times their friends don't really know them. They, they know only what they've allowed their friends to know, and they've never told them about this that's been going on, whatever it is. And a lot of times in the context of that, uh, acceptance, it, it, it becomes like a family for the, the other people. And some people are so comfortable, they will talk about childhood abuse, physical, emotional, sexual abuse that they've never talked about anywhere else before. Um, sometimes these people are, are dead, or they were in another state, and, or... Um, or they were the priest that they had as, as another church uh, years ago, and nobody knows where that guy went. But, you know, it's those kind of things come out in these groups. What are some of the biggest things and some of the biggest signs that somebody's dealing with grief or going through something? Well, uh, it affects everything in, your, in a person's life. It affects their mental you know, um, life. One of the things that that affects people and because they can't concentrate on what they should be. You know, the guy is sitting, or a girl or guy is sitting in class. The teacher is talking up front, but they can't focus on what the teacher is saying. They're in another world, thinking about what they have experienced. They're preoccupied with this situation or series of situations that have occurred in their life so they're they can't they their, their grades fail so it's a mental thing they're uh, um emotionally they can be either angry guilty just sad or depressed um 
that if it's in conjunction with something else, it can make somebody not want to live. They want to give up on life. So you, you have to really do a lot of listening to find out what's really going on in a young person's life. You know, the, the, the stated original problem that they're dealing with um, is usually only part of it. It's, it's usually the safest thing that they want to talk about. You know, one group, of, I've, I've had several bunch of kids who've come from homeless situations and that might be the initial thing that they talk about. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm homeless. My, my dad or my mom, they, they left us and we're, we're homeless. But there have been a whole lot of other things going on because it just happens. There's, sometimes there's drug addiction in the family. There's abuse in the family and all of that piles on, on top of it. See, and then there's the physical thing. Sometimes people are, feel lethargic. They can't sleep. Um, sleep and f eating is a real big indicator of how someone is dealing with something. That's one of the things I usually ask them. Have you been able to sleep? And if they can't sleep, that means they are going to be more likely to get depressed. And then if they're not eating on top of that, that can really throw them for a loop. And then they go see a, a, a counselor and they put them on medication to help them deal with their sleep and, and their depression. But it, it, sometimes the, the results are not what they had hoped for and they become even more depressed or suicidal. Sometimes those are the side effects of some things that young people are put on. Um, but it usually starts with something safe to talk about, but as you, as they feel comfortable and trust other people, a lot of these young people have trusted. That's why their friends don't know what's going on in their lives because, you know, in middle school and, uh, high school, if you put some things out there, they will try to destroy you with it. That is true. Is there That's how it was when I was in what we called junior high back then. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to those viewing who might be dealing with some grief or might be going through something? Is there anything you'd like to say to them directly? Well, um, it's possible to work through and deal with through your grief and to grow through it. It doesn't have to destroy you. A lot of times people... Um, that was one of the things I noticed when I first was growing up. I saw a lot of people who I, I had a cousin that was killed in Vietnam and I, it, it made it very difficult. It almost seemed like the, the, some people lose hope when they lose someone and life goes down. And when you, when you're, when you're at a, uh, a facility like Betty Ford and you hear their stories for, for years, things have been going downhill and getting worse. And, but there is a possibility that you can grow through grief and uh, become a better, stronger, more resilient person. And that's one of the things that I um, have seen over and over again is that young people who have dealt with their grief and worked through it, it's sometimes very difficult and very painful and very complicated, but then they're able to know how to help and express hope for others when they encounter them. I, I often have kids who said they shared with their friends and their friends, you know, they were able to help their friends. Not only have it, has it helped them to handle new issues of grief and life because they're, they're constant circumstances that bring grief in human life and uh, in year 2020, we have all kinds of new ones. Who would have ever thought that we'd have a generation that didn't get to graduate or didn't get to go to funerals or they lose all of their friends. They're stuck at home and, and only talking to them on Zoom. It's a, 
something I never would have expected. But, uh, but it, it allows people to be able to cope. When they learn how to deal with one kind of grief, they, they're equipped, or at least better equipped, to handle it again in the future. Well, Tom, I appreciate all of your time, all your input, insight. Thank you for sharing all this. Thank you, Harrison, and I hope I wasn't rambling too much. No, no, thank you. It was very educational. <laughs>